so when uh, when this example uh, appeared, so people try to modify it in various ways to get something more out of it and so on. So so I show you some so there are some modifications. I think the first modification was due to uh, so modifications of the uh, last example. So instead of sign and you can take something which is like piecewise affine and it kind of approximates sign. So, the first one it was due to James. And so, take a uh, So choose function instead of of time. So this gives you uh, piecewise constant gradient in the unit square and. Uh, you get a, out of it, you get a, a probability measure. So the picture looks like this. So you have something like that. So there are four pieces here. You need four pieces here. And then you have something like that, so for the and you get a probability measure mu, which is a sum of lambda i Dirac AI. So this is a so this is the co co uh, coefficient with of the convex combination. So lambda i is non-negative and lambda i come to one, delta yeah. AI are um, Dirac measure supported at matrices which come from the SOR2 function. So you take the SOR2 function and you say it's a, say maybe F of X1 and uh, F of X2 and F of X1 plus X2. This will be my test function phi of x1, and this is phi of x2, and then this is phi, uh, phi of x1 plus x2. And then what you what you get is uh, you get a measure which is such so for every Quasi convex function W, you know that W at the body center of this measure, which is zero, is more or equal than the integral of this W. Or if you integrate this measure over the over the matrices in three times two. So for every quasi convex, however, if W is only 
Rang khoang con về hết. Then this inequality doesn't hold. Because we have this function constructed by Schwerer. The other modification, which is a little bit more um, sophisticated, is due to Milton. I think it's about 96 or so. So he takes different functions. So he defines a function g, which is a function which goes from 0, 4, R and then he takes also a function h which goes from 0, 4 to R and then g of t is minus 3t if t is between 0 and 1 and then is t minus 4 if you are between t and 4. So it goes from 0 to 0. And if you are at 1, then you are minus 3 here. And then if you are, so, that, so that's good. So, so it looks like this. It's 1 here, it's 4 here, it's 0. So it goes steeply down, and then it goes up. So this is G. And then the function H is a bit different. It's more standard, say, so it's a symmetric. Uh, so G of T equals T here and minus T here. And this is if T is between 0 and 2. And this is for the rest. So this is uh, this is um, H. And now you do the same construction. So now you take your phi of x is uh, is uh, g of x one, g of x two, and H of x one plus x2. And so the picture looks like like this one. So this is a square, which is 0, 4. This is, uh, this is uh, 0, 4. This is 4, 4. So this is four zero, and um, you again get a piecewise affine gradient. So um, this is one here, and then I have one here, and then then I get something like that. So I have this. I have this one, then I have something like that. So this is the division of this square into pieces where the gradient is, is constant. And so if I put here minus, minus plus, it means because the gradient is minus, so it's minus three, minus three, and plus two. So this means, so minus, minus, plus, means 
um, minus c zero zero uh, minus three, and uh, then we have h is one one. So this is this is the notation. So minus minus it means for the first two components and then plus for the last one. So here is minus minus, here is plus minus plus plus minus minus plus minus plus. Then we have minus plus plus minus plus minus minus plus 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 minus and uh, something uh, is missing here and this is plus plus minus two so this is the division so this is the notation for this but then then for the rest is like this so again so this gives you the distribution of uh, of gradient, and now you take. So this is my. So now you take a met, Now you take a matrix J. Or let me call it F maybe, and this will be minus one zero zero minus one minus one and minus one. And you look at F plus gradient of C. Again, this is something which is uh, which is um, piecewise constant in this in this square. And because uh, of the values of of T, so whenever we have plus here somewhere and plus is some plus is everywhere, so um, it's always like that, that at least one of the components of this matrix is zero. Because whenever you have uh, the missing brackets, because when, whenever you have this function H, it only has plus one or minus one the gradient. And because you have always some plus somewhere here, then you always get uh, um, zero. So this always has, uh, it's piecewise constant and and it always has one zero component. So in particular, this function G um, what should I say? Maybe maybe it would be better if we do G tilde here. I'm sorry, because we have this G function already on Friday. I call this G tilde. And then we know this G is, is this is the function which is defined on this RST, and this is my minus RST. So we know that G at F plus gradient of phi is zero in zero four to the power two. But G at F is one. Because as you remember, I mean this means this is this R S T corresponds to R S T. So whenever we have a probability measure, which is um, defined as a sum of weighted Dirac masses sitting here, 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 and here, or more precisely on this, on this set, so the Schwerak function will, at least this G variant will give you zero there, 
by the first moment, which is, which is this f of this measure. So if you evaluate a function g, which is like that, on this function f, you get, you get one. Huh? So if now you take a measure nu, which is a sum of Dirac masses, lambda i Dirac at f plus phi, then g at the first moment, this is g at f and this is one, but if you integrate g, over, then you get zero. And this is more than G of nu bar. So this is a, this is a, a measure, probability measure, which we call it gradient measure or gradient Young measure, which we will see the reason for calling Young uh, today or on, on Wednesday. And G is this function due to Schwerat, and now you say, but this is only defined on this RST subspace. But uh, still this holds if we add a bit of epsilon. So the same holds for If you replace G by G epsilon, and recall that G epsilon, this was G plus epsilon, and there was now this, let me call it R zero, zero S CT to the power two plus uh, the same thing to the power four. If epsilon is small enough. I think epsilon has to be smaller than one over 1036. Not positive. And now you extend outside of the subspace, but this doesn't hurt because uh, we know all these matrices are in the subspace. So once we add this K term there, like we had it on Friday, then nothing happens. What is, what, what is my what? What was the my definition of new this this is this is new your new bar you mean two lines above. So nu is a probability measure where you have lambda i. So this is, has a form lambda i, so you sum over i. And uh, lambda i are portions of this area where you have the particle plus plus minus divided by, divided by 16, I think, four times four. And the, uh, the, these guys here, these are Dirac measures supported on matrices which are of this form. So F plus gradient of phi and gradient of phi has this form here for this. So you can evaluate it. So, I mean, I don't know the, the areas, but this is always like uh, mm, this plus something like that. So for example, if I am here, 
if I have this plus, 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 so it means I have plus, plus, and plus, so uh, if gradient of phi at some x equals plus, plus, plus in our notation, this means you take g tilde, it's plus, so it's one, one, it's one, zero, zero, one, one, one. And uh, so f plus gradient of phi of x is then actually zero. And so on. So these are Dirac sitting there. And then, yeah, and then So um, the same holds for G epsilon K. Uh, where G epsilon K is this function from Schwerat's example with rank one convex. So you have to take k large enough, but here it doesn't matter. And this example, or maybe I can go to the other half. So, um, because we have these various notions of convexity, we can we can now um, also define various halves of sets. Like you have convexity, and you have convex uh, convex functions, and then you have a correspondingly, if you have a compact set, you have a convex half. But now if you have, say, quasi-convexity, you may ask, what's the quasi-convex hull of a set? And this would be the center of, of so this will be a set of points uh, where each point will be a um, first moment of some gradient measure sitting on the original set. Like if you have a convexity, uh, then, then, then you, then you simply take all probability measures supported on the set, and then this, this gives you the convex half. So, if you have a set that capital K, and now let's do it m times d is a compact set i mean i don't know why but usually in the literature you always find it for a set k i don't know why so is a is a compact set then then q of k is a Set of points F in R uh, M times D such that there exists a gradient probability measure. Supported on A such probability measure may be mu, let me call it mu, supported on K such that mu bar 
and this is a b mu a over the set k is f. So this is the first moment of the measure. So you integrate a b mu a. So this gives you a uh, a metric in our space because you do it component by component. So if I forget this gradient and I take any probability measure, I would get a convex hull, a convex hull of K. But here I don't take every probability measure, but only the measure which satisfies the Jensen inequality for every quasi convex function. What are convex functions? It's a larger set than convex functions. So uh, there might be measures like the one here that do not satisfy the Jensen inequality for, um, uh, I mean, so, so, so I want to know. I want to say there might be a quasi convex function that doesn't satisfy the Jensen inequality for every probability measure but only for uh, for special measures. So this, uh, this hull is smaller. So if this is a C of K, this is a convex hull. That C of K is, is larger than the, than the quasi convex hull. There's a space because you can also define a polyconvex how of the set K that you take measures which satisfy the Jensen inequality Jensen inequality for every uh, for every function which is polyconvex. You know that polyconvexity implies quasi-convexity, but there is this da Coronia Alibert example which says that there are functions which are quasi-convex and not polyconvex. So in general, uh, quasi-convex hull is smaller than the polyconvex hull. And I call polyconvex hull like that. So this one is convex, this one is polyconvex. This one is quasi-convex. Now, we still can go on with these inclusions and put here the rank one convex hull. And this one is again smaller in general because uh, there are more rank one convex functions. So you have to test the Jensen inequality by more functions. So it means you maybe exclude some of the measures. And there is even something here, which is called in the literature um, lamination hull. L of K. That's the smallest. And this is when you allow, so here you take all rank one functions and test the Jensen inequality. Here you take all rank one functions, which also can take the value plus infinity. So this is a set of points. A 
tak dot f rovná mu bar for the probability measure ability measure mu supported on k such that such that uh, mm, W and F is more equal W A V mu A for every uh, for every W R M times D to R plus infinity rank one convention. So here this is important, this is plus infinity because RK here is exactly the same thing. You only take So you exclude plus infinity. So do we know an example where these two are really different? Maybe. So, for example, uh, there is this P4 configuration from Friday. Do you remember? This was this square, and we had these, I think it was like this, maybe, here, and here, and here. No, sorry, it was here, and this was here, and this was here, and this was here. So this was this, so there was the point, there was this point B, this was C, mm. Here we had V and here we had A. So, and you remember that this was the picture in in the space of diagonal matrices on two times two. So, this was a X component, Y component, and A, B, C, D were always of the form x, zero, zero, y. And we calculated, if you remember, that whenever the function is zero at these points, a, b, c, d, then it also has to be zero on this square and on these limbs. So this means that the rank one convex hull contains the square and all the limbs. But the LK, the lamination hull, contains just the same, the, the, the original set. Because I can take a function which is, so if this is K, If, if this is K, then 
we know that uh, R of K is um, is this this object. So if I say the square and the limbs. And if I take an L of K, it's just K. Because I take a function W, it's zero if F belongs to K and it's plus infinity otherwise. So this function is rank one convex trivially. So it's an indicator function of the set. And uh, so this is rank one convex. These are not rank one connected, so. And whenever I am outside K, then I have plus infinity, while all on K I have zero. So I cannot really uh, do anything. So that's a difference. You can also show that LK can be written as a union between one and infinity of L I K where L um, L one maybe I let me put it from zero, so L zero of K is K and Li plus one of K is uh, the set of points A in the space of matrices such that A equals lambda A1 plus one minus lambda A2 where a1 minus A2 the rank is equal A O times B, so for some A and B, so it's a rank one matrix. Uh, A1, A2 live in Li of K, and lambda is something between uh, zero and one. So if you look at this definition, you, so you can show that this is equivalent. And, and you see, I mean, that here you even cannot start because there are no rank one connections. So you stop. But for many cases, uh, they are also the same. Like for example, if you take two matrices which are rank one connected, then the lamination hull and the uh, rank one convex hull of these two sets is just this line segment between A and B, and this is the same. So this example due to Milton, or mod the, this, this modified example due to Milton, because this is not his original example, it's a bit modified, shows that there is a, there is a set such that this, is, this hull is really smaller than this one. In particular, um, the matrix uh, F doesn't, doesn't belong to the rank one uh, convex hull of this set F plus grad phi, but it belongs to the uh, quasi-convex hull. So this was, this was left from the Schwerach example because Schwerach example didn't really say that. So it was just that there's a different function, but it's still not clear whether the halves are. This is a stronger, stronger statement.
um, no. the set uh, if you take if k equals f plus graph phi of x for x in 0, 4 to the power 2, then uh, then f belongs to the quasi-convex half k, but f doesn't belong to the rank 1 convex half k. If you want to get a set such that this one, this one, and this one are different, then you then you take those matrices here, and then you add these transpositions. What we did, you know, you remember on Friday we had this example that if you if you take this transpose subspace L, there are only trivial deformations such that this is a function of X1 and X2 or X2 and X3. So then that you cannot really get anything interesting. So you take this matrix transpose. So now this is something is like two times three, something is like three times two. So maybe you comp you equip it with, with some zeros to make it three times three. And then you get a set for which this, this, and this is different. But uh, the lamination how is the same like rank one convex half for this. So oh, this is uh, this is quite uh, quite uh, interesting construction, I would say, but uh, it's difficult. And why why are we interested in in a polyconvex half and a rank one convex half? Simply because this is very difficult to calculate for a given set, because you have to take all first moment of measures which satisfy the Jensen inequality for every quasi-convex function. And uh, we don't know what are the quasi-convex functions in reality. I mean, this is just a notion, but it's very difficult for a particular example, like this Alibert da Coronia example, to, for a fixed epsilon to say whether this is quasi-convex or not. So, but uh, polyconvex is maybe not so complicated. It's a little bit easier. And maybe this one is also difficult, but this one is not so complicated because you can use this uh, iterative formula here. You still can, you still can distinguish here if you take functions which take value plus infinity, whether you take those which are lower semi-continuous or whether you don't care. If you take only those that are lower semi-continuous, so it's a smaller set of functions, means larger set, then you get a closed hull. For a compact set, the lamination convex hull would be closed. If you take every rank one convex function satisfying this target space, then uh, you, may, you may end up with something which is not closed. So you start from a compact set, but the hull is not closed. And this was the example due to collage. Um, so 
So LK does not have to be closed. Also, K is compact. You can also work for on non-compact sets, but then it's difficult because you have to say what is the growth condition on your test, on your function. Because if it's compact, it doesn't matter. And I think it was about either the end of the 20th century or the beginning of 21st, so let me put here zero, zero. So this is interesting because otherwise you end up with this with, with compact set if you start uh, with the compact set. Is there a seminar today, or do we do we end at eleven thirty?
So maybe I also say a, a little remark, which because sometimes students ask me about these rank one connections between matrices. This is something. How can I really use it? So uh, it's like a remark saying that uh, rank one connections connections. I don't want to say in everyday life, but quite often. So if you do numerics, you do piecewise affine elements, and then you have a piecewise constant gradient A and B here. You have uh, some continuous. functions, let's say finite element method. So the gradient is A and B, and it's a, there is an interface, maybe the normal is nu, and the function is piecewise affine, it's, so the gradient is, is jumping in the normal direction, but it's continuous along the along the interface here. So the gradient on the interface on the left is A times identity minus nu O times nu. That's the tangent gradient from the left. And this has to be the same as the tangent gradient from the right. The normal is different, but because it's new times two, so it cancels. So what you see is A minus A new O times new is B minus B times new O times new. So in particular, A minus B is um, A minus B new O times new. And so it already means that this matrix has a rank one, because if you have a multiplication of two matrices, then the smallest rank counts. And this is a rank one matrix. So it only works if A minus B has a rank one. So, So this is somehow that you, 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 if you do numerics, you see it every day. Another remark is that um, it's local. Lipschitzity, Lipschitz continuity. Of separately convex functions. So it means that rank one, poly, and quasi are included, convex two of rank one, poly, quasi function, quasi convex. Functions too. And it's a, it's a lemma which you can find in the book by Da Coronia. It was a little story I have to tell you, I, I like it. So 
I was doing something many years ago. I think it was 1999, maybe. And I n didn't know this result. And I really needed it for something. I mean, if I had something like that, it would really um, help me. And I was in Zurich visiting a friend of mine. And I had a desk in the office and a book of Da Coronia. And I did some moving the stuff around and the book fell down and open on the page where this lemma was stated. And so I took the book and said, oh, now I can proceed. So this was kind of, you know, if you, if you try hard, you get it. So um, assume the W which goes from M times D to R is separately uh, convex and and W of A um, in the modulus is smaller or equal than C times one plus A to the power P is at least one for all A. Uh, M times D. And a constant P which is positive and independent of A. Then there is C tilde bigger than zero. I think you take C tilde at least C, but maybe you can take precisely C such that W of A1 minus W of A2 is smaller or equal than this constant C tilde. 1 plus a1 to the power p minus 1 plus a2 p minus 1 times a1 minus a2. And this is true for every a1 and every a2 in R and times D. So in particular, if P is one, so if you have a function with linear growth, then P is one, so this, this disappears and you get exactly the Lipschitz continuity. Otherwise, it's only local Lipschitz continuity because if you fix some A1, you find the neighborhood of A1 where A2 lives and then this is true. But it's important that you have these properties. So the, so for example, I mean, I think the, the, the original statement is due to Marcellini, and, but you can also find it in the book by Da Coronia. So this can be used to show that sometimes if you have at least W of this form, so it's bounded by the P power, that you can test quasi-convexity by uh, functions which, which are in from W1P. They don't have to be from, from W1 infinity. 
and that's the notion of uh, W1P quasi convexity. And this is Ball and Mira. Eighty, eighty-four, eighty-two, or eighty-four. So eighty. The same paper where you have this uh, counterexample to uh, v continuity of the determinant. So um, if w Quasi convex and satisfies satisfies uh, this growth condition. then M for every um, bounded Lipschitz and we know already by the same argument like if P equals plus infinity before that you can if you if you prove it for one omega then you prove it for every uh, Lipschitz domain, so you can you can say also work on a unit square or unit cube if you want. So uh, this is non non. Uh, I mean, this is non-trivial because w one p. This is more function than w one infinity if p is finite. So you have to test the inequality by more function. So why this should hold? But it holds because of this property here. Because you take your function phi in W1P and you approximate it by Lipschitz functions in the W1P norm. You cannot do it in W1 infinity norm, but you can do it in W1P norm. And uh, you proceed. So, if you take, um, assume the phi k converges to phi in W one P. And P K as a subsequence belongs to W one infinity um, zero and and then you use. Star star here. 
Spotify. Uh, to uh, to estimate. So you start with uh, this thing here. So you know you. W at A is smaller or equal than the integral over omega. Um, w A plus gradient of dk x dx, because this is a W1 infinity function. So, and this is uh, smaller or equal than W A plus a P of X plus, and now we have the C, the C tilde. Mm. And I put there the difference, so I get a gradient of phi of X minus gradient of phi K of X. Uh, P minus one, maybe one is missing here, so I put it here, plus uh, No, the difference comes later. The difference comes later. So it's one plus, and I will take, take this one and this one. Num comes the difference, and the difference is dx. Now, because this is in W1P, so the Helder inequality tells you that this is bounded, and this goes to zero, because you have the strong uh, approximation in the norm. So the gradients are converging to zero because of this. This is a strong convergence in the W1P norm, and this goes to zero. Um, sorry, the, 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 this term goes to zero, and so this converges to um, only the integral because this guy converges to zero for k going to infinity. So this, for example, tells you that if you do finite element calculation and you use piecewise affine element, that you can really approximate property or the minimum of your function or well because of this. Unfortunately, if uh, this gross condition in the, in the box doesn't hold, for example, if we would have a function which would be quasi-convex but would grow to infinity if the determinant goes to zero, then this doesn't hold. And this may lead to some gap between minimizers on W1 infinity and W1P. And this is called Lavrentiev phenomenon. And it's known from the beginning on, of uh, 20th century. And it's, uh, say, in one of the examples, but also it's, uh, it's a problem here. And it's a message for elasticity. Unfortunately, if um,
does not hold. Then, then um, they W1P and W1 infinity say, if I call it quasi convexity, this is the original one. Do not have to coincide. So if I take a quasi convex, so so if if uh, you if for example if it's quasi convex and W of f goes to plus infinity if that f goes to zero. then we might have a problem. And the construct of a function like that is easy because you take a quasi-convex function and you add one over determinant, for example. So, so one over determinant is a polyconvex function because it's a convex function of the determinant. If determinant and you extend, plus extend by plus infinity for matrices that are um, uh, of negative or zero determinant. So for example, um, you can take something very simple. So you just take f to the power two plus one over the determinant of f if that f is positive and plus infinity otherwise and I should mention this Lavrentiev phenomenon. Two different minima of variational of of uh, i of y and this is w of that y dx on W1 infinity and W1p p smaller than infinity. And this is called Lavrentiev phenomenon. So this is already, now, now I'm starting to list bad messages for us, like for people who try to do some elasticity calculations and theory, so this is the one thing. And others will come. I'm not sure about the spelling here. I think J E. Maybe some people say I E. 
in Cyrillic is written somehow, and now the transcription to our alphabet is uh, has various versions. So let's have a look. So we up to now, up to now, we know that uh, quasi convexity is a necessary condition for v cloud semi-continuity of the function of like there, i of y. But maybe we can say something about sufficiency as well. So a um, proposition. So assume ah, the standard assumptions um, is continuous. I of u equals integral of graph u for omega r d a bounded Lipschitz domain. Bounded Lipschitz domain. If if W is quasi convex, then then I from W1 infinity to uh, R is uh, sequentially the Euclid star flower semi continuous. And we already know that if this has this property, then we derive quasi-convexity as a necessary condition. So this is about sufficiency. Now, if If you add a growth condition of this form for some p at least one, then I sequentially WLSP, which means weekly lower semi-continuous on W1P. So now the assumption here is even stronger than before for this proposition, because now I want, I have a function which is non-negative. I mean, you can also have something which is 
which is um, smaller than zero. In fact, In fact, you can even weaken it. You can weaken it. The condition zero is more than W of A, and this is E one plus A to the power P can be weakened to um, to minus c times uh, one plus a to the power q is maybe c tilde here. is q is smaller than p. Uh, so this can be, I mean, we don't have to be strictly positive. We can even grow. So the negative part of w can have a growth, but the growth has to be smaller than the p growth. So do we have a example that I cannot put p here? Think a bit. Because it would be really nice. Because then I have the proposition over there, or the, the estimate, the local Lipschitzity. But uh, this is very important. So we cannot. Take P equal Q because Q because we already know that. Uh, If you take a determinant, and P equal P, then until this is M, that the result So this is a uh, bit expansion, say, but uh, we may stay with this because for us in elasticity W is a potential of the first pure Akirhoff stress tensor. And as a potential, if you add a, fun a constant to a potential, then the stress doesn't, doesn't change. This is like with voltage, say. And so, you know, we can assume that this is always non-negative. I mean, here we can we, uh, we cannot exclude it because I mean it's it's not it's not uh, allowed because you have this growth. So this is not for elasticity. The result here, and this is one of the main and open problems in elasticity that the result for quasi-convex integrands only holds if you have if you have this growth condition or. It's not gross. It's like it's like yeah, it's a gross condition. 
Of course, if you want to prove the existence of a minimizer, you put some norm of A from the left too, because this is possible and this gives you coercivity and then boundedness of your minimizing sequence and so on. But still the gross, like one over determinant, like above, it's not allowed. And so this is, uh, this is somehow why we work with polyconvexity, because there it doesn't matter, but this is, as I stated here, it's like a sufficient condition also for v or semi-continuity. So if you really want to be very general, you would uh, phrase everything in this quasi-convexity business, but then you cannot. Or you have to somehow explain why in your model the behavior of the determinant is not so important and you know, and this is already a bit fishy, so. Mm -hmm -hmm. So maybe I erase it because this is And we will see why, why this is a problem.
I think here there was the thermal goes to plus infinity. I meant to zero. So there are various cases of the proof. So one, one is easy. So assume that, assume, so that UK goes weekly star to U. W1 infinity. So, um, and then first, so the first point will be U of X equals F times X. I've given matrix, so it's an affine function. The limit is an affine function, that's the assumption, so. Uh, one particular case would be very nice. For example, uh, if uk equals f times x on the boundary, because this is just definition of quasi convexity. Boundary this uh, then uh, the result follows. from the definition uh, of quasi-convexity. Because we have um, I of UK equals W of Grad UK, X dx. Now this has a boundary condition Fx. So it can be written like F plus gradient of U tilde, where U tilde has zero boundary condition, or U tilde has a zero boundary condition. And so this is even element by element bigger than W of F times the measure of omega, and this is I of Q. So this, uh, then this is a very easy case because you really get it for every element, so also for the limit. If still U is Fx, but uh, UK doesn't have the right boundary conditions, you have to do something, and now this is the this is the troublemaker for elasticity because we have to, the definition of quasi-convexity, if you want to use it, means we have to 
adjust boundary conditions and then I can say something. And adjusting the boundary conditions, this typically means you do some cutoff function. So if UKX is general, then what we do, we take a, we manipulate, we manipulate it in the vicinity of the boundary and the manipulation is the following. We take eta uh, of x. This is something which will be one if x belongs to omega prime and it will be zero on d omega and the picture is like that. So this is my omega and omega prime is a subset of omega such that the distance here is maybe, I mean, I don't put eta any index, but if I have a sequence of these cutoff functions, I can say that the, the thickness of this ring will be one over L and L will go to infinity, but we don't do that now. And and then we take VK and this will be U, the limit, which is F times X plus eta UK minus U. So if you look at it, so now uh, this cutoff function is zero on the boundary. So on the boundary, this vanishes. And on the boundary, I have u, which is fx. So it's already good because I have nice boundary conditions. And uh, if you calculate the gradient of vk, this is a gradient of u plus eta gradient of uk minus gradient of u and then is this term which is um, um, gradient of eta yes but now i know something happened it's okay now, uh, what do we see here? Um, uh, because UK goes weakly to U in the in the space of W one infinity weak star. So, so somehow it means UK goes to U uniformly. So you can make this term arbitrarily small. We use the Helder. So you have a gradient of eta, which if you do this rim construction, this would be like con constant divide, uh, times L, because then you go from one to zero on a line of thickness L, one over L. So, but this can, so, so at some, if I take K large enough, I can assume that my gradient is smaller than some constant C, but C was already here. So I take C tilde if K is large enough. Huh? And so what do you do now? You um, apply the The lower semi-continuity for this, because VK has good boundary conditions. So if we know, I mean, we can apply a, um, a definition. 
So now I start with this. But you know that UK only differs from VK at this little neighborhood of the boundary. So this is the limit for K going to infinity. And now you take the whole integral over omega of W grad UK. And this is, uh, here I take omega minus omega prime where something happens. So here I subtract grad UK and I add grad VK. So I take W grad VK minus grad W grad UK. X, also here comes X. Uh, EX. So here this, this gives me uh, my condition because this is now like VK, so this is bigger or equal than the integral over omega W of F dx plus this error which I have made by replacing, by, by having something different than, than VK here. Plus some other constant, say C tilde tilde, and uh, I take the measure of omega minus omega prime. Uh, could you? There is omega minus omega prime, and then you take VK minus grad UK. This comes from the fact that um, VK is this form, and uh, here, here VK and UK do not dif differ because this is the same here, and only the difference is here. So I want to have VK, so uh, I take here UK the whole thing, so this is like VK, but only inside my omega prime, and then I take a difference. So I subtract UK and add VK here, and then I have VK. So this is like the I of VK. No, the, the VK, the UK has various boundary conditions, and we have to manipulate them in such a way that they are affine. Or the, 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 they are the boundary conditions of the limit. And so this is, I mean, because for that we can apply quasi-convexity. And so the, mis the error which you make is just something by, which is kind of measured by the difference of omega minus omega prime because the gradient is bounded like uniformly pointwise and, and um, and uh, W is co continuous, so you, the, the error which you make is some constant times the measure. And because this measure can be as big or as small, you finally have the result. Um, goes to zero if omega prime approximates. Omega. So this is, uh, this is, uh, and only this, this, this shows the trouble. Because if you have a function which, which for example is plus infinitive if you if you make the determinant uh, negative, then you cannot do this. Because this cutoff 
this cutoff here can destroy the sign of the determinants. Huh? Determinants are non-convex functions. This is this is good for convex functions, so because it's like a convex construction, but for determinant it's a problem. And that's that's the key thing that prevents us from using quasi convexity in, in elasticity. If you if you remember polyconvexity was different. It did use the Mazur lemma instead of manipulating boundary conditions. And this was the advantage of quasi of polyconvexity because you don't care about boundary conditions and you just manipulate the weakly converging sequence. Now, if you have general U, you you do it. The second step is U is piecewise affine. The same thing, you do it locally on each piece where you have U affine. And finally, the final step is to approximate piecewise affine, uh, uh, the general U by piecewise affine function in a similar spirit like we did it for this lemma, and that's it. But the problem here, this is the key problem. So uh, the, if you say you can replace this construction by something else, then this would help. So it's also one of the, so John Ball has written a article which is called Open Problems in Elasticity. And this is the problem number one, to, to uh, get the right notion of quasi-convexity for elasticity. So prove, so find the notion of quasi-convexity in such a way that you can allow for functions that go to infinity if the term goes to zero. So if you want to, you know, I'm a little bit losing losing uh, because you didn't do anything over the weekend. So, you know, but this is another problem, which is, of course, also very difficult. So quasi-convexity is always necessary because you can take a, func a sequence of functions which doesn't have this property problem with the determinant. So you take something which is, which determinant is, is, fine, uh, is nicely bounded from zero but to, to show that quasi-convexity is also sufficient is a problem. Open problem. get a right notion of quasi-convexity or elasticity. <coughs> Still, there is something known. We do this picture again. So this was omega prime, and then this is omega. And then, so we have to do something here, and we don't want to do the cutoff function. So uh, one possibility is to uh, solve some uh, differential inclusion. For example, you, you assume that your gradient of VK belongs to some set of matrices which are positive uh, determinants.
And you also have to make sure that the boundary conditions are satisfied. So on this inner piece, here you have that VK equals UK. And here you assume that VK equals U. So you go between UK and U and the gradient of your map is never a non-invertible matrix or positive determinant matrix. So this is called partial differential relation. It's not equation because I want to belong to point light. In, in uh, omega minus omega prime. So we started even with something less ambitious and we said just let's take matrices that are uh, invertible. Maybe the terminal can have a negative sign. And this, this really helps because you can replace this by multiples of, of um, um, orthogonal matrices rotations or reflections and you can you can you can do that so then you get the result for um, maps that are plus infinity if the determinant is zero but still the negative part the negative determinant can be there then so we did it with Barbora Beneshova and my students. Um, and Gabriel Passon. Then for P finite, we did it for W1 infinity. For P finite, for P smaller than N, um, Omatos, Uh, Rindler and Wiedemann they did it for p smaller than the dimension so sorry this is this is d p smaller than the dimension and positive determinant but if p is uh, higher or equal e, then it's not known. And then we did p equal infinity and by Lipschitz maps. In the plane. So D equals two, this was me and Barbora Beneshova. So this is a case which is very, very special because you have lots of regularity of your map. So you are like W1 infinity and also the inverse is W1 infinity. So, so it's by Lipschitz, so very restrictive. And, uh, and only in the plane. And the reason why he put it in the plane because there is a result by Tukia from 60s. But this was retaken by Daneri and Pratelli uh, 2010 something. But if you have a bi Lipschitz map defined on a boundary of a unit square, you can extend it inside as a bi Lipschitz map. And so you know it from, um, for Lipschitz maps, this is Kurtz Brown theorem, or McShane Lima, or it has various names. So, and then you even can keep the constant in case of Lipschitz map. Here, if you have by Lipschitz, the constant grows. And so they reproved the Tukia result. So it was Tukia in the 60s, and then Daneri, 
and Vasily. Say 2010 or maybe later. Then they even calculated the constant. You know, it was the constant increases, and they gave a kind of um, the proof by construction. And then we could use this because it means you simply extend only on a line, which is like a dimensionless problem, and then you use the result to extend to the square. And this was possible. And it's very demanding on, on writing and notation, but it only works in, in deeper too. So every, everything is be, be in between is open. So again, if you have some idea, then you can try. And it's very, uh, very important because uh, if you forget the determinant constraint in elasticity, then typically your energy is defined in, the, in terms of the co right Cauchy Green strain tensor because of the frame invariant. And this is F transpose F. So this has the determinant either zero or positive. So the sign of the determinant is forgotten. And so, so if you don't embed it into your theory, you lose it soon. And then, um, because for example, in 2D, you can just check, very, it's very simple proof that if you take orthogonal matrices, and then you take proper rotations, determinant one, and, and reflections, determinant minus one, then every element from one group, one, one set is, is uh, rank one connected to the set in other. So any, any two you take, there is rank one connection. If you think about some quasi-convex function, which is defined here, then suddenly it's much lower than if you take the uh, quasi-convex function, which would be plus infinity if the determinant is zero. Because here you really have to have lots of convex, convex direction. So, um, yeah, this is largely open. But it's also difficult. So sometimes you could also want to, as last, like we did this Eisen lemma. So you want to include X, U, maybe, or graph U. So. Uh, Extension. So, um, if if W is a W of x, u of x, and the gradient of u of x, then the story is is different. But quasi convexity is is still important. Um, Would you assume that it continues here and here, and it's measurable here? That's the Karateodori integral. So, So again, if you say zero is small or equal than W of, of uh, X and uh, maybe U and F, and this is bounded by a constant times one plus U to the power P plus F to the power P, 
key is at least one, then um, I of you defined now by um, is weekly lower semi-continuous on W1P. If and only if W, um, X, U, and dot is quasi convex. And this is Acerbi and Fusco. I think eighty two. So this allows you to include to include also you in your consideration. And uh, if you want to get something negative here, then it's then it's a bit tricky because then you really uh, may come into troubles. So assume that um, W of X, U and F is bounded by a constant times one plus f to the power p, but maybe negative, then we assume that w, x, u, and dot is uh, p positively, positively, p homogeneous, which means that W, X, U, lambda F equals W, X, U, no, lambda to the power P and um, F. So you can, if you have a lambda here and this is a non-negative number, then you can take it out with the power P, and then you have just F here. So it's P positively homogeneous, uh, positively P homogeneous. And consider U in W1P, zero of the unit ball, extended by zero to the whole space and define UK of X. This is um, K times P divided by P minus one of UK. So this is my, my sequence. And this means that the gradient of UK of X is K times N, uh, K times D divided by P UKX gradient.
So this is the sequence. Now we calculate the uh, limit along the sequence, or lim inf. over this unit ball. So this is uh, the ball here. And we have W of X and now we plug uh, U, K. So this is K times D. And then we have the gradient, which is K, D, D gradient of U, K, X, D, X. So now I use this P homogeneity, so I write it as uh, the ball here, take K to D, W of X, K, D, D minus one, U, K, X, and then you get um, gradient of U at K, X. x now if you do the change of variables formula then this um, kills it gets killed by by the by the uh, Jacobian and then you get something So this goes maybe I can remove this And because this function uh, u is uh, is zero outside the ball, so even if I expand the ball, then I still work on the ball. So I have the b zero one, and I have w of x divided by k, and here I have k d d minus one u at y say and gradient u of y um dx dy and this is this is supposed, so this is the limit still. It's going to infinity. And this is supposed to be bigger or equal than if I want lower semi continuity, then it should be um, x, and then because u. UK goes to zero in measure, so I have zero here, and then I have also uh, zero here. Why? But now you see what happens. So if, if D, if P is bigger than the dimension, if P is bigger than the dimension, then this, this has a coefficient here, which is K something, so this, this disappears. The limit is it's plus infinity. So you get really like zero, zero, and got ui. If d equals p, then you have one here, 
So you get just ui in the limit. And if d is more than p, you get something which is, which you have to really calculate the limit. So somehow depending on, on, the, on the space where you work, whether you work in something which is, which is w1p for p bigger than the dimension, or equal dimension, or below the dimension, you get different conditions. So, uh, so the result strongly depends depends on on the relation of v and p. So if p is bigger than the dimension, then you have very nice continuous function. And then you get zero here, and then you get uh, in the limit something what gives you the right notion of quasi-convexity. But if d equals p, then also this term is involved here. No? So it's not so easy now. And this is because you may have concentration. So you may have a jump of the gradient at the point where u is discontinuous. And because, uh, so, so the jump and uh, concentration, so concentration is like a measure that you converge to a measure, but at the point when the measure is supported, you have a jump of the other contribution. And so this is not clear what happens. And so that's why this is difficult. But for uh, this, there is a paper by Mayers in 1965. Norman Mayers. Oh, Mayers. He was working on these kind of problems, even including higher order gradients. And he isolated some conditions that the integral has to satisfy, such that quasi-convexity is also sufficient for weak lower semi-continuity. But it's quite restrictive, in particular, in this lower order terms. So there are some conditions known, difficult to verify, but everything here is difficult to verify, because just to verify that your integral is quasi-convex is, is, is difficult. He even sta stated, states some condition in, in the spirit of that for every sequence, so it's very, very implicit, so. So maybe I tell you still one more thing for these negative integrands, and then, because we uh, have to uh, finish at half past two, there's a seminar, as Ulisse said, so then we go on on Wednesday.
So um, if let's assume that if um, if p is uh, two quadratic, so p will be two, p will be three, and uh, the um, And yk goes weekly to y in w1 2 because p is 2 of, of a half ball. So d are, um, are, what is what the r3? And d is a half ball. It's a half ball, which will be exactly like that. So and here is the normal new. So D equals X is in the unit ball. X dot nu is positive. Then I of Y, which will be defined as A X for factor of gradient of Y of X applied to the normal nu uh, DX over the this, this D is sequentially sequentially equal flower semi-continuous on W12 gamma the ball zero one R3, and this is the space of function u in W1, 2 of the, of the, uh, of the ball, this value in R3. And uh, u equals zero on gamma, where gamma is uh, the boundary of the ball. So some, somehow an A a is continuous. So this is an example of a non-coercive integrant where for factor you know it can have a negative sign. It's, it's like a subdeterminant, so it can go also to, it grows quadratically, but also decays quadratically. But if you apply it to the normal, which is fixed here, and you multiply it by A, then this function is sequentially weekly lower semi-continuous. So you don't have this problem like we had with the determinant. But the normal new has to correspond to your domain. So somehow the, the shape of the domain uh, enters also the game. So this is just like an example. And uh, yeah, you can also make it X dependent if you, if you take new depends on X and um, you know, it's, uh, and then you can also work it out on, on more general domains. But somehow it's very important that the domain is, is also included through the normal here.
So this is a so this is a situation where you can show that this is sequentially weakly lower semi-continuous is even sequentially weakly continuous. And I mean the notion which we need besides quasi-convexity is called quasi-convexity at the boundary. At least for 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 integrands which are too positively homogeneous, like for factor eight in three dimensions. Um, yeah, and I think I would stop now. So.